Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live via Skype with James Jacob Prash. Jacob, the topic today is John MacArthur and the blood. Is he right? Well, for those who are not aware of what John MacArthur is teaching in regard to the blood of Jesus and salvation, it's this. In your Hebrew commentary, you state that we are redeemed, quote, not by his bleeding, but by his dying. Do you still stand by that and why? Yeah, it wouldn't, uh, we're not saved by his bleeding because it uh, wouldn't have done any good if he just bled. This was a big controversy years ago. People, uh, some people who were enemies of me decided to fabricate all kinds of strange things, and we got kicked off 55 radio stations, and all because they said I denied the blood of Christ. Uh, well, look, if Jesus had just bled, nobody would be saved. Um, the wages of sin is not bleeding. The wages of sin is death. And uh, people must understand that it's not the bleeding of Jesus and it's not the blood of Jesus. To speak of the blood of the cross, the blood of the cross, is to simply speak of the efficacious, substitutionary, sacrificial death of Christ. Do I think he had to, to, to actually die, uh, actually bleed? No, not to save us but to fulfill the Old Testament picture. Somebody suggested that I might have thought he could be bludgeoned to death. Well, I suppose if God had decided that's the way he would die, it would be fine, but the pattern and the picture of the shedding of blood was in the whole Old Testament sacrificial system, and as the fulfillment of the final lamb, he fit that model and that pattern. But we are not saved by his blood. There's a, there's a weird theology that floats around that people have that turn the blood into a fetish, and they actually believe that, and, and I've dealt, tried to deal with this, with some people who accuse me of denying the blood, that somehow God collected all the actual blood of Jesus, collected it all, at, around the foot of the cross, put it in a bowl and took it to heaven, and it's up in heaven sitting on a mercy seat, and every time somebody's saved, it's dumped out and recollected and then dumped out again and recollected. Of course, this is wacky kind of theology. Um, there's nothing magic in Jesus' blood. I mean, just I mean, try to think that through, right? There's nothing magic in his blood or his saliva or any other part of the fluids of the human body. I don't need to get too graphic here. I mean, what we're talking about is his death. And blood is a euphemistic way to refer to his death, particularly when you realize the, the blood shed that occurred there. So I'm, I'm not saying anything different than Orthodox Christianity has said for its entire history. We are not saved by his bleeding or by his blood as a fluid, but by his death. He is saying that it's not the liquid itself that saves. Okay, that would be bordering on a form of sacramentalism. And he can make that argument, and he has a valid point. But he's going on to say that, and he's emphatic about this, that the blood of Jesus only means his death, was saved by his death. No, he's not correct. He's wrong. John MacArthur has always been overrated as an exegete. He's not a good expositor. Well, he's not a particularly bad... Well, stop there. He's never been a particularly good expositor. He's been good in his presentation, but his content has never really been all that good. And he has begun in more recent years teaching some rather serious error. It's not simply his Calvinism we disagree with. His view of church history is, frankly, silly. As a Baptist, he lauds Calvin 
as if he were ignorant of the fact that he would have been arrested by John Calvin. He would have been arrested, <laughs> possibly even executed in Calvin's Geneva for being a Baptist and holding the belief as baptism. Yet he holds Calvin up as an heir to the heritage of the apostles of apostolic Christianity. He takes the Reformed tradition, and then he takes the patristic tradition of Augustine. Uh, and he says that this is the heir of the apostolic tradition from the New Testament authors, which they are certainly not. Augustine, as we said before, was a Platonist. The apostles were not Platonists. They did not teach the things Augustine did, but we dealt with this on other broadcasts. His view of church history is conspicuously flawed. His cessationism is categorically false. The notion that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles, in the charismatic sense of the gifts of the Spirit, is as wrong on one extreme as the neo-Montanism that is charismania, hyper-charismatic extremism, and ultra-Pentecostalism are on the other. He's as wrong on one extreme as the hyper-Pentecostals and hyper-charismatics are on the other. It's demonstrably false to be exegetically shown that these gifts did not end. He's reading things into the scripture it didn't say. More seriously, he bases doctrine on something not literally stated. He admits that the pre-trib rapture is something that he says is not there, it's between the lines. How can you base a doctrine on something not stated, or what he describes as between the lines, but he takes that as a basis to say it'll be possible to worship the Antichrist, sell your soul to the devil, in effect, worship the image of the beast, take the mark of the beast, and then be saved. This is false teaching. But now there are questions that people are raising about his understanding of the gospel. I do not think personally, based on anything he said, that John MacArthur is preaching a false gospel. I don't think he's preaching another gospel or a false gospel. But I do think he does not properly understand the true one. Again, he is greatly overrated theologically as a Bible expositor. Greatly overrated. The very fact that he was in bed with R.C. Sproul, who, who sprinkled infants, tell, tells you something. Well, well, he's a Baptist. That he's something of a confused man. Certainly his actions are less than logically coherent. But let's understand what he's saying. The blood of Jesus means his death, and that's what saves us. First of all, we are not saved by his death, full stop, period. We're saved by his death and resurrection. He died to pay and atone for our sins, but he rose to give us eternal life. That is salvation. We cannot and should not separate resurrection from crucifixion. Both are vital to the process of our salvation. Both are essential to the gospel. We are not saved simply by his death, although his death is absolutely mandatory and vital. Those who would, die, who, who would deny propitiation, substitutionary atonement, are heretics. They do have a false gospel. People like Steve Chalk in the USA, or William B. Young, author of The Shack. These people are by biblical definition, not even Christian. They deny that Jesus died for our sin. But John MacArthur has a half a gospel, in a sense. Let me explain where he goes wrong. Why? In the crucifixion accounts, in all four passion narratives, in all four Gospels, in all four crucifixion accounts, in all of them, why is the blood not mentioned once? In Levitical worship, which prefigured and foreshadowed the sacrifice of the Messiah as a blood atonement, why is the blood not mentioned once in any of the crucifixion accounts, in any of the passion narratives, in any of the four Gospels, not even once? It is only mentioned 
after he dies, when he is taken down, when he's on the cross, and about to be taken down on the cross, and a Roman centurion or soldier stabs him in his ribcage. And a mixture of blood and water comes out. It's only post-mortem, only after Jesus is dead, having paid the price for our sin, do we see the blood mentioned. Why is it omitted? Why is something that figures so heavily in the Levitical worship that prefigures his sacrifice? And why is something that's recurrent so much in the epistles, why is it not mentioned even once in the crucifixion accounts in any of the passion narratives in any of the four gospels, not even once? <clears throat> the blood only comes into play after he dies. Now, the stabbing into his rib cage, into his side, as it were, I won't go into it now, but it relates in figure to Adam, to the woman being taken out of Adam. The church would become out of Christ with his death. Then he, Adam wakes up. It's a picture of the resurrection of Christ. Jesus is the last Adam. It relates to that typologically. Of course, we don't base our doctrines on types, but it's a typological illustration. But we will leave that for the moment. What John MacArthur fails to understand is the nature of atonement, at one moment. That's an English word. The Hebrew word, korban, is translated at one moment. We are one with God because of Christ, his sacrifice. But how does this work? There are two aspects. It is seen both paschally and korbanically. That is, in the Passover and in Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, one explained more in 1 Corinthians, the other explained more, obviously, in the Epistles of the Hebrews. What am I saying? At the Last Supper, Jesus said, Zegufi sheni badchem. This is my body broken for you. And then he takes the cup and he says, This is the blood poured out for many. Why the body and blood? Why body and blood? What Mr. MacArthur is saying, equating the blood with the death, is basically akin to what Roman Catholicism does when they only take the Lord's Supper with the bread, not with the wine. Not that I believe in transubstantiation anyway. The Roman Eucharist is another problem. But it's the same idea. He's conflating the death of Jesus' body with the blood of Jesus. No, no, no. It's the body and blood. If his blood equaled his death, you'd only need one emblem in the communion, not two, but in the Passover and in the Last Supper, which is a Paschal Seder, Passover meal, we have two, the body and blood. Why is that? Jesus took our sin in order to give us his righteousness. He died our death in order to give us his life, its imputed righteousness. He dies our death to give us his life. He takes our sin to give us his righteousness. The breaking of his body, not his bones, the bones could not be broken, but the breaking, as it were, the crushing of his physical body, relates to the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, if you can follow the reasoning of, of Hebrews. The temple had to be destroyed. The Messiah would fulfill the law and you no longer need blood atonement for sin anymore. But the judgment came on Israel in the form of the temple's destruction, as predicted by Daniel and by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse. So instead of that judgment that came on Israel, the judgment for our sins as believers, both Jew and Gentile, came on Jesus. His temple was broken. Now let's understand this. 
the death of his body has to do with death. But the life is in the blood. Let's begin with his taking our sin to give us his righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin. His physical body personified sin. He took our sin, having none of his own. Had to die. He died our death. That's the body. But the life is not the death. The life is the life. It's the blood. The body has to do with the death. The blood has to do with the life. The body has to do with the sin. The blood has to do with the righteousness. Hebrews, Ephesians, Romans, and 1 Peter tell us how the blood is efficacious. In 1 Peter 1.19 and also in Ephesians 1.7, we read, <clears throat> the blood redeems, it buys us back. A life for a life. The life is in the blood. Hebrews 9.22 tells us the blood cleanses. Righteous, sinless blood cleanses away our sin because we have bad blood. Okay. Romans 5.9. We're justified by his blood. So we have cleansing. We have redemption. And we have justification, cleansing or purification, redemption and justification achieved by the blood, not by the body, by the blood. In the body, he dies the death. In the blood, he gives the life, buys us back redemption, makes the foulest clean, justifies the sinner, gives us access to the father. That is newness of life. That's the blood. His body is the death. His body takes the sin. His blood communicates the righteousness. What happens when somebody is born again, we might describe it as a spiritual blood transfusion. We get the blood of Jesus. It's an imputed righteousness, not of our own, but we benefit from it. It gives us life. Our old nature dies with him on the cross. No, the blood does not equal death, full stop. It is the death of his body that has to do with death. The blood has to do with life. We take the Lord's Supper with bread and wine, corresponding to body and blood as a memorial. John MacArthur is completely wrong. John MacArthur is once again wrong. He's completely wrong about cessationism. He's completely wrong about his misguided view of church history and of the apostolic heritage being passed on patristically and through the Reformation, through the Reformers. He's wrong about those things. He's more than wrong, more than mistaken. He's teaching dangerous error in his view that it will be possible for people to sell their soul to Satan by taking the mark of the beast, worship the Antichrist, effectively worship personification, an approximate incarnation almost of Satan, and still get saved and go to heaven. This is a dangerous false teaching. But even his view of the gospel is misguided. It's incomplete. He doesn't correctly understand it. I'm not saying he's not saved. I'm not saying he's preaching a false gospel or another gospel, but he does not clearly understand the true one. No, the blood of Jesus does not equal his death. It's what happened to his body that has more to do with death. The blood has to do with life. The body has to do with him taking our sin. The blood has to do with giving us his life by means of redemption, cleansing, and justification. It's bread and wine. It's body and blood. They're both aspects of the death, but the death cannot be separated from the resurrection. Remember, 
in all four Gospels, in all four Passion narratives, in all four crucifixion accounts. There's no blood. The blood only comes after the body is dead. Now, there was blood. We know by his stripes we are healed. The horns would have caused bleeding. We know that. But why did the Holy Spirit inspire that blood not be included in the text? Why did he inspire the apostles to write about the blood in the crucifixion accounts in any of the Gospels? Why? Since it's so important. Because it is not primarily to do with his death. It is to do with his life. Most of the blood of Jesus and the bleeding of Jesus was internal. According to medical experts, pathologists who crucified cadavers that were executed or crucified, sorry, Roman execution style. This was part of the research done the first time back in the 1970s on the Torvin Shroud. The research was done in France. It is reckoned Jesus would have died from a combination of hypervolemic shock and pericardial effusion. That involved internal bleeding, not outward visible bleeding. And it would correspond medically, those who are expert in such fields tell us, to the burst of blood and water that came from his ribcage when he was pierced. You would have had that kind of a subcutaneous buildup of blood and so forth. Nonetheless, that is the reality. John MacArthur is wrong about many things. And I'm sorry to say he is even wrong in his understanding of the gospel. The blood does not equal the death. That's not accurate. Now, his syncophants like Phil Johnson and so forth, they'll defend anything he says. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, true or false. They'll defend anything he says. We accept that. But we do not look to man. We look to the Lord and his word and his spirit that leads us into all truth. What John MacArthur has taught in this regard is not true. The blood does not equal death. The blood has to do with life. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Jacob.